Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm a computer scientist and cognitive scientist uh, with li very little expertise in math, but my interest is in how we can get machines to form the kinds of concepts and abstractions that we humans can form, uh, which is, I think, very relevant to the question of whether we can get machines to uh, do mathematics. So I read with interest this essay by um, uh, Akshay uh, Venkatash, who, who's the person we're honoring today. Uh, and in the introduction, he makes an analogy with uh, DeepMind's Alpha Zero, teaching itself chess and go, surpassing human performance, et cetera. And he asks, uh, what if 10 years we have something called Aleph Zero, which does the same for mathematics? And he then asks, is it, it, can we wonder about the specifics of its capabilities, this machine? Will it be able to visualize higher dimensions, produce proofs that are displeasing, or even oracular insight without proofs? Will it surpass us at all mathematical reasoning tasks? A scenario that we should certainly not dismiss. Well, if we think, if we, if we want to consider this thought experiment, I think we have to ask ourselves, is mathematics like chess and go, something like a closed system that is governed by axioms and rules with concepts that are learnable by something akin to the self-play algorithms that um, DeepMind used? Or are mathematical concepts more like our everyday human concepts that are grounded in our physical and social experiences and can be abstracted via analogy? So uh, if we believe the former, then I think the prospects for something like the um, imagined Aleph, go, um, Aleph Zero would, would be certainly uh, very reasonable. But if we believe the latter, I think that it's going to be much more challenging. And I'm going to talk about why and also what, how AI people are starting to think about abstracting and forming concepts. So, you know, in mathematics, abstraction is obviously an important part of the way human mathematicians think. You know, we start off with the basic object, the, the basic concept of an object, which then leads us to concepts of number, like the, this in psychological terms, uh, subitizing multiple objects, meaning being able to see and perceive instantly that there are, say, three or four objects in a scene. And this leads to many abstractions in um, both everyday life and in even higher mathematics, such as the notion of counting or the notion of rational numbers beyond the integers, the notion of zero as a number, which evidently was um, highly contested early on in, in mathematical research or even negative numbers, which didn't seem to correspond to anything in the real world at first, but then we now think of them just as the same as regular positive numbers. You know, irrationals, vectors, all of these things can be thought of as abstractions of, comp of, of the idea of number and operations that um, go along with numbers are then extended in an abstract way to um, these abstractions of the concept. So I was highly influenced by some of the ideas in this book by Hofstadter and Sander on analogy making, especially in mathematics. And I recommend it to you if you're interested in that topic. And one of the things that they claimed is that the human mind is forever driven to transform its categories, not just to use them as givens. Something that you know we struggle with in AI the idea of not just using given categories. And intellectual advances in every field are dependent on conceptual extensions like the ones that I mentioned about the concept of number. They go on to say that mathematics itself is indeed a, const a constant drive towards greater abstraction. So if you take a familiar phenomenon like the, the set of prime numbers, you can try to pinpoint what's its essential essence, its deepest crux, 
and then try and locate that exact essence in other structures that are less familiar. So we can take the idea of prime numbers and extend them via analogy to concepts like prime groups or even in knot theory, the idea of prime knots being able to factorize uh, something as abstract as a knot. So, and, and other many other examples of this that I'm sure you're more familiar with than I am. I was also very influenced by uh, this book by Lakoff and Nunez, two cognitive scientists who studied in very great detail the conceptual metaphors that are used by mathematicians in uh, abstracting ideas in um, going from very basic arithmetic all the way up to the most abstract mathematics. And one of the things that they say is that much of the abstraction of higher mathematics is a consequence of the systematic layering of metaphor upon metaphor over the course of centuries. And each metaphorical layer carries inferential structure systematically from source domains to target domains via analogy. So if we want to think about various um, inferential ideas in arithmetic, those often can be carried via these analogies to these higher level concepts, such as in group theory, complex analysis, and so on. So now to AI. Many of you are probably familiar with um, the first AI conference, which took place in 1956. This is from the proposal for that conference in which these luminaries of the field uh, proposed to the Rockefeller Foundation a summer of AI research in which they would try to make progress in several areas, including language, um, machine learning, and so on. But one of their main goals, of course, was to get AI systems to get machines to form abstractions and concepts. And I would claim that this is still um, really a completely open, uh, open problem in the field of AI. That is really the biggest problem and not being able to solve it is the biggest limitation to progress in the field. So we all know that the deep learning revolution has changed the the, the face of AI, it's made progress in any number of areas such as image recognition, for instance, on the ImageNet competition, which is an object recognition competition that was held for many years, um, that uh, this is the error rate of the best program on the uh, half a million test images uh, so error rate going down obviously is progress. And you can see when deep neural networks were introduced into the competition starting in 2012, that the progress was enormous. In fact, exceeding what is an estimate for human performance on this uh, task, on this data set. And this has led to the ability of AI systems to for instance, recognize objects in a visual scene on a road, as you might want to in a self-driving car with great accuracy, and even to uh, seem to rival humans at language abilities. So for instance, you're probably familiar with OpenAI's, OpenAI's GPT-3, a language model with 175 billion parameters which is pre-trained on text amounting to hundreds of billions of words, and then can be used to do things like generate language. So for instance, I, I asked GPT-3 to take the first um, two sentences of um, Menkasha's essay that I talked about um, and to complete it. And here's what it said. It was it said that it you know how would things change if LF zero were to teach itself mathematics? It would effectively be able to do it better than any humans. This would have a profound impact on the field, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
and it comes up with a very coherent completion. So it seems natural to ask ourselves, do these language models actually understand language in the way that we do, that we humans do? And to understand the physical, social, and even more abstract concepts that language describes. So this is uh, the title of an essay, recent essay by um, Blaise Aguera Iarcas, who's a AI researcher at Google. And his answer in this essay was pretty much, yes, they do. Then we've you know, recently also seen things like DALI and other uh, text to image generation models. It's a Dali's for, also from OpenAI, a 12 billion parameter version of GPT-3, trained to generate images from text descriptions. You may have played with it yourself and you can use it to um, put in a prompt like students playing Frisbee in a university quad, impressionist style, and it will output uh, some images that are really quite impressive. And you can really, you know, ask it to do even very uh, non-realistic things like a purple bat tasting apples in a bowl of fruit with its tongue. It, I gave it that prompt and it instantly came up with this, these possible completions in the term in, in image um, space. Uh, so, you know, people in the press have characterized this as, you know, we're getting, this is really a, a immense breakthrough in AI that um, brings wonder and danger and that we now have to think about how good AI is getting. So it's natural to think that, you know, these incredible um, examples of AI prowess will lead us to something like general intelligence and perhaps uh, the, in Venkesh's thought experiment, AI being able to do mathematics better than any human. And people in the AI field, you know, have tweeted things like, it's all about scale now. We just have to scale up these models in order to get to general intelligence. But the real question is, what are these machines learning? Are they learning the kinds of concepts that humans learn and are able to then abstract in ways that um, I talked about earlier? Well, it, it's it's unclear because the models are so um, large and um, not very transparent. So here's one example from my own research group. One of my graduate students trained a deep neural network to decide if a photo contains an animal or not. He trained the system on a large corpus of nature photographs like these, and then tested it on another part of the corpus that it hadn't been trained on, and it was very accurate at classifying whether an image contained an animal. But when he looked under the hood of what the neural network was actually learning, he was able to uh, demonstrate that it really was, in many cases, looking only at the background of the image, not at the animal itself. And it was using a cue, that is, is the background blurry or not? to predict whether the label is animal. And, you know, because most of the images of animals in this corpus had blurry backgrounds because the photographer was focusing on the foreground. And here on these landscape photos, their background was clear. So this, was a, this is a statistical shortcut, a statistical correlation between blurry backgrounds and labels, animal versus no animal, that allowed the system to look like it had learned the concept of animal, but actually had taken this statistical shortcut. A similar uh, result came from an experiment where uh, a group used instead of images that were scraped from websites, like in the ImageNet competition, they used images that were taken by a mobile robot moving around in a home, looking at taking pictures of sort of uh, objects in the wild, asking, uh, can a system that's trained on web scraped images generalize its knowledge, its ability to classify to objects taken in this kind of, format. And it turned out that when you train on 
these, these are a whole bunch of different neural network architectures. When you train on images that are come from the web and test on that same distribution of images, these systems, their accuracy is very high. But when you train on systems, you train on images from the web and test on these same categories that were taken by robot moving around in a house, the accuracy uh, falls dramatically because the system itself, the vision system has not learned the kinds of general concepts that we humans learn. It's learned something special about these web-based images. Again, another example from 2018, this group took objects, pictures that were um, correctly classified with very high confidence by a deep neural network like a school bus and photoshopped the um, objects into different poses in an image. So here the neural network, the same neural network is 99% confident that this is a garbage truck. Here, 100% confident that it's a punching bag, 92% confident that this is a snow plow. So some of the, these objects that are correctly classified in one pose can be um, incorrectly classified with very high confidence in different poses. So these kinds of very non-human like errors show the brittleness of these systems show that they're not learning the same kinds of concepts that we humans are. Same kind of thing with fire trucks, it, different poses. It's convinced of a school bus or, oops, or a fireboat or a bobsled. Another example, uh, back in uh, 2016, DeepMind uh, it displayed its uh, deep reinforcement learning system, later used on AlphaGo and successors. Here it was uh, applying it to Atari uh, video games like Breakout, where you use a, you move a little paddle along a horizontal to hit a ball, which is then able to um, collide with bricks up here, these colored uh, squares or rectangles, and then explode them. And the higher up the bricks, the higher the score. And DeepMind's system was able to um, play this game at a superhuman level because it learned a strategy where it, it tunneled out the side using the ball and then the ball just bounced along a, a, around the top by itself, um, exploding the highest value bricks. Okay, and this, this was a really uh, a ve very um, widely uh, cited discovery of a deep neural network that didn't, you know, that learned on its own, this incredible strategy. But a group, another group said, well, what happens if we change the game a tiny bit? We shift up the paddle by a few pixels. So any human who had learned this strategy would be able to um, adapt to this new version of the game. But when this group in 2017 tried um, a deep, reinforcement learning system that was trained on this version and was able to um, come up with the superhuman strategy, it could not play this version well at all. So it couldn't transfer what it had learned from one situation to a very similar situation, precisely because it had not learned the concepts that humans use to abstract. So it had not learned the concept of paddle, ball, brick, tunnel, you know, any of these concepts that we conceptualize this strategy. It had rather learned statistical correlations among pixel configurations and actions to take. Um, and this is also shown by the brittleness of these systems uh, um, in adversarial attacks. So this group was able to show that um, a, a, a system that had learned very uh, very accurately to identify stop signs could be fooled by putting these little stickers in a certain configuration on these stop signs to convince the system that it was seeing a speed limit 80 sign, not something you would like your self-driving car to do. So in language, we saw, so, you know, people have shown some incredible brilliance in these systems in completing prompts but if you ask it to do very basic kind of geometric reasoning tasks, 
like here I'm asking uh, GPT-3 to reason about putting a green box on top of a blue box, putting a yellow box on the green box and a red box on top of that. So we can visualize this, you know, in our heads, green box on top of blue box, yellow box on green box, red box on that. I took off the red box and put it beneath the blue box. What's on top now? Well, I think most people would be able to reason about this and say um, that the yellow box is on top, but if you ask GPT-3, it gets that one wrong. You ask it what's on the bottom. Well, um, we would probably say the red box, and it's confused. So it's not able to reason about these geometric concepts um, because it doesn't have any model of the physical world. It hasn't learned that from the language that it's been trained on. And it also amusingly has problems with negatives. So if you ask it to write a sentence that is not about ice cream, for example, it has a lot of trouble. Here's the sentence it came up with. I'm not a fan of ice cream. <laughs> so <laughs> um, the same problem seems to apply to these text to image pr uh, problems. Um, so here I ask it to draw Dali to draw a yellow box on top of a green box, which is on top of a blue box. And I tried again and again, and it was not, unable to draw that configuration. And it also has a problem with negatives. Again, a bowl of draw a bowl of fruit with no apples. All right, it really, it could not do that. It could not draw a single bowl of fruit with no apples. So these are just examples of the kinds of difficulties these systems have with simple concepts. And this all fits into what in AI is called Moravec's paradox. Hans Moravec, back in the 1980s, I think, wrote, it's comparatively easy to make computers exhibit adult level performance on intelligence tests or playing checkers. So this was pre computer like Deep Blue and computers beating grandmasters at chess and difficult or impossible to give them the skills of a one-year-old when it comes to perception and mobility. And I would add something like common sense. So in short, what these systems are learning, I would argue are what you might call perceptual categories rather than the more rich robust concepts that we humans learn. So what's a concept? Well, I like the definition of um, Lawrence Barcelou, a cognitive psychologist who defined a concept as a competence or disposition for gener generating infinite conceptualizations of a category. So think about the number, the, the, the example of the concept number that I gave earlier. Well, mathematicians, I would say, have spent a lot of uh, effort in generating almost an infinite number of conceptualizations of what the idea of number could actually mean. And you can see this also in like everyday concepts like bridges. You could certainly get a deep neural network to recognize what a bridge looks like by giving it a lot of examples, but it wouldn't be able to generalize into non-standard kinds of bridges like this water bridge where boats travel over the road via a bridge of water or a bridge of ants, bridge that ants make with their bodies to move from one surface to another or go going even more for further we talk about, we humans talk about bridging our hands or the bridge of a nose or the bridge of a song we're able to, in this same way, um, metaphorically abstract these concepts to make sense of different situations, like bridging the gender gap. You know, we think of that as a kind of a physical bridge in this metaphorical sense. Or Joe Biden talking about how he, during the campaign in 2020, how he was a bridge to a new generation of leaders. Everyone understood that almost instantly without even noticing that it was a metaphor. 
and you could go on and on. I'm not going to go through all these examples. And bridge is not a special concept that can be extended in this way. Really, any concept that we have can be extended in this um, abstract metaphorical sense. And that's really the power of human concepts. That's our ability to uh, use them to understand new, conceptualize new situations, which is something that AI struggles with. Uh, Hofstadter had a different definition of concept. He said it's a package of analogies. And you can really see that in this example of uh, bridges, and I think in any other examples of abstraction. So the question for AI is the same question that the pioneers asked in their 1955 proposal. How can we get machines to learn concepts and abstractions rather than perceptual categories and to make analogies? So in the remainder of this talk, I'm going to talk about three approaches that people have made to um, thinking about how to get machines to make these kinds of abstractions. And these, uh, these are all in idealized domains, but I think the same kinds of approaches um, have been made in less idealized domains, but have the same kinds of properties. So back in the 1960s, the Russian computer scientist, um, Mikhail Bongard, wrote a book called Pattern Recognition in which he proposed a kind of neural net-like architecture for vision. And at the end of the book, he proposed a set of puzzles, visual puzzles that were idealized abstraction challenges. So the idea of these Bongard problems is that you have six figures here on the left and six figures on the right. And your challenge is to say, what is the unifying concept on the left contrasted with the concept on the right. And I think for humans, we would say easily spot that these are three-sided versus four-sided shapes. Okay, here's another example. You know, and you see, you look at these and, and the challenges to figure out what all of these have in common, it, because they're superficially look quite different as shapes. But here you can see that, you know, we sort of have a vertical orientation versus a horizontal orientation. Here's another one. Here we see that um, there's a structure of inside, um, outside a shape versus inside a shape, even though the shape is not connected, we sort of complete the connection. Um, here is a, one I like a lot, um, kind of an abstract, but even more abstract version of three versus four. And this one that humans get very quickly, I think, where we see that, you know, over on, on the left, we have sort of twin figures, the figures that are the same. And here we have figures that are different. This concept of sameness versus difference is something that people have tried to get AI systems to understand more generally, but it turns out to be quite difficult. So the challenge of these Bongard problems is that you, you don't have, like in the world of deep learning, tens or hundreds of thousands of examples to train on. You only have six examples on either side. So this is a few shot abstraction challenge. And it turns out it, even though Bongard put this as a challenge for AI in the 1960s, as far as we've come since then, we still don't have any system that can solve these tasks in any general way because we don't have any AI systems that can make abstractions as we do. So Hofstadter in his book, Gödel Escher Bach, talked a lot about these um, Bongard problems. And he set it up as one of his goals for building an AI system. But he realized they were much too difficult at the time, which was in um, the 1980s. And so instead, he devised um, 
a, an easier ch abstraction challenge that he did think was approachable called the letter string analogies, something I collaborated with him on in graduate school. So these are strings of letters that try to capture abstractions in, in an analogy format. So if you change the string ABC to the string ABD, so there's a transformation, how do you change the string PQRS in the same way? Well, that depends on how you conceptualize this change. Of course, there's no correct answer sort of that you can, it's just that what humans will conceptualize this as is a success, a, a string of um, increasing in the alphabet in which the last letter changes to its alphabetic successor. So most people will say PQRT. They won't say PQRD, which is perhaps another possible answer, or even ABD with the rule change all any string to ABD. That seems too literal. And we devised hundreds and hundreds of these analogy problems that involve things like grouping letters or reversing strings or um, re uh, replacing a sort of uh, fixing up strings so that they uh, are certain kinds of more structured uh, groupings. Um, and the idea was that like the bond guard problems, these are idealized situations with objects, relations, groupings, and here even actions and events. And they're meant to be a tool for exploring general issues of abstraction and analogy making. So this is older work, which I um, did as part of my um, PhD dissertation, building a computer program that can solve these problems in a cognitively plausible way. Uh, our architecture for solving these took inspiration from neuroscience and psychophysics, such as the work of Treisman et al. on integrating bottom-up processing sort of more parallel random bottom-up processing and more deterministic focused serial, what she called attentive top-down processing. Also thinking about areas in uh, the brain as active blackboards that integrate and sustain results of computations performed in higher areas. And finally, the notion from Kahneman, Treisman et al. of object files in which in these active blackboards, um, modifiable temporary perceptual structures are created on the fly, which interact with long-term memory. So just as I can't, I, I don't have time to tell you um, in detail how this architecture works, but I'll tell you very briefly, then show you a demo. Each uh, analogy problem resides in this workspace, which is akin to working memory. There's a long-term memory of concepts where the concepts are given to the program. They're things like successorship, the letters in the alphabet, sameness, alphabetic uh, grouping, uh, and so on. A small repertoire of concepts. And for each problem, the perceptual structures that make sense of these um, structures in terms of the concepts are created by what we called perceptual agents, small pieces of code, or some called them codelets, which built up perceptual structures, data structures such as groupings of letters. These are the interpretation of the program of, of these strings. And these agents interacted with this concept network to activate concepts like sameness, which had been discovered, and the activations then fed back to make those concepts more likely to be discovered. And you'll see that this was all controlled by um, what, what we called a computational temperature. This was a measure of how coherently the structures that had been constructed in, uh, fit together to interpret the problem so when things were disorganized, the temperature was high. As the system started acting and building structures, the temperature uh, 
lowered. But this also was a feedback mechanism which controlled the randomness of these perceptual agents. So let me show you a demo of this. This is a, um, a video of the program's graphical interface as it runs. You can see the temperature here at its maximum of 100 Celsius and the, work pro, the uh, a problem in the workspace. I'm not showing the concept network because I don't have room for that here. But what you'll see is these perceptual agents trying out things very randomly at first, building structures, lowering the temperature, which then causes them to act much less uh, random and much more deterministically. So these lightning bolts are the explorations of these perceptual agents trying to find relationships. These lines are possible relationships that the, the darker they get, the stronger they're considered to be by the system. So here's a grouping that causes the concept of grouping to be much more active, which causes these groups to be perceived much more quickly. Then there's a relationship between this A in the first string and the group in the bottom string. And you can see these, the system's kind of freezing in as the temperature goes down on a explanation or a representation of what is going on in this problem and is able to come up with an answer here, reverse direction of the string and here, reverse direction of the whole group. So that's um, just a quick overview of this system um, where this whole idea of this high level cognitive process was sort of thought of as a idea of perception in the mind's eye, high level perception where a representation is actively built up over time with perception unfolding dynamically and continually integrating top-down and bottom-up processes and also symbolic and sub-symbolic uh, kinds of processes. A continual integration of prior knowledge that is the concepts in the concept network with the bottom-up perceptions and perceived context and an emergent transition from a very bottom-up parallel random kind of processing to a more top-down serial deterministic attentive mode of processing, which is seen also in human perception and human problem solving. Okay, this program had a number of limitations. It's very not clear how general the architecture is. It was meant to be fairly general, but um, it hasn't been tried on that many different domains. And also the question of how, how to form new concepts beyond what's given to it in its prior conceptual repertoire. Um, I'm going to skip ahead in the interest of time. Um, let me just skip. Um, I'm not going to talk about the deep learning system because I, I'll, I'll answer questions about them at the end. But I, deep learning is not really able to do these kinds of conceptual abstraction problems in any general way. I'll just summarize that. <laughs> but I, I, a more recent challenge, kind of similar to Bongar's challenge on these kinds of abstraction problems that I think you'll find interesting, were, were, it's given by Francois Cholet of Google Research. He called it the abstraction and re reasoning corpus. And it's similar to the cop hop copycat problems, the letter string problems, except now these are visual problems where that are based on uh, transformations between two grids. So the idea is that you have a, a few task demonstrations where you have one grid here on the left transforming into a grid on the right, according to some rule. And you can see the, 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 the demonstrations. And now the challenge is generate a new grid based on that same rule, given this test input. So here you can see that you know these are kind of horizontally arrayed colors, vertically arrayed colors. So you can imagine what a new grid would be. And Cholet, you know, here's another 
um, problem in that domain um, where, you know, we humans can conceptualize this in many different instantiations, what's, what's going on and apply it to a new um, input. So these are similar to, to those other domains I talked about, the Bongard domain and the copycat domain. Here we have over and under as a concept. And here, um, outlining a rectangle, find other rectangles. And Cholet created a, a thousand of these, what he called tasks, and put them on um, this machine learning challenge web, web platform called Kaggle offered 20,000 in prize money for a program that can do well on this domain. And the best programs so far are able to get about 30% of the test cases solved given three guesses for each uh, problem. And none of them are able to do it in any general way. So this still remains a challenge here in 2022. So I would say that, you know, this challenge of forming abstractions and concepts is is going to be absolutely key to getting machines to do mathematics and really anything else in the way that we humans can do in a robust format, in a robust way. And as Hofstadter and Sanders said, without concepts, there can be no thought and without analogies, there can be no concepts. So this is really a uh, key. And I would add to that is how to form and flexibly use concepts is really the most important open problem in AI. I talk about this quite a bit more in, in my recent book on AI. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions.